GM Fox fam. We're going to get started here. I was hoping that was going to be a smooth transition. I had to add one more keyboard note in there. Um, well, happy Friday. Happy to have you here with us for the operations DAOFIS hours. Um, we're going to chat about uh, a whole bunch of stuff. I don't think we're, we might need the Zoom. I don't know if later, Ron, you want to share some of the stuff you've been working on. Um, but anyways, there's a Zoom in the stage chat. We might be using it later, um, maybe to look at the retro that we might be talking about. Um, I'll jump in right now to make sure that that Zoom doesn't close. Um, and we'll be talking about a couple of things. Normally, we like to keep these office hours a little more unscripted and open for feedback and things like that. But there's a whole bunch of topical things that happened in operations land over the last two weeks that I felt like it would be appropriate to have some discussions, conversations on here in the DAO. There's a lot of things that are maybe old hat for some of us as shapeshift employees um, that have crossed over into the DAO that um, new centralized um, contributors, or excuse me, decentralized contributors or community members um, that um, are recently joining and watching might be unfamiliar to some of the terms or the procedures or the meetings that we go through. So I thought it might be nice to talk about maybe what to expect with some of these things um, as they've happened. And it'll be nice to get some perspective from others out there and um, our ops assistants. We've got a great split of both people who are jumping in new for the first time and learning these um, drinking from the fire hose and those that are um, trying to figure out and pick up the pieces from our old processes and looking at what's still relevant now that we are a DAO um, and what we can kind of agile, agilely optimize. So um, yeah, um, on that agenda, you'll see we're gonna talk about a whole bunch of things. Some of them I'm gonna move through a little bit quicker. Um, and then we'll also open it up to talking about conversations um, deeper if you guys have questions on them. Anyone on the stage, if I'm monologuing and you have something to add, feel free to cut me off um, um, and we'll we'll make it a discussion instead of just one person steamrolling all of y'all. Um, I'll start at the first though. Um, number one, we do have some budgeted positions for operations assistants that are opening up. Um, the proposal allowed us to add one new assistant per month through the length of that um, first work stream proposed um, timeline. And then at that point to take a evaluation on if we had hired enough or not, and then kind of bake into the next proposal if we were going to continue to add more roles or if we were going to stay in pat. So we have added Ron and never was as the first um, hires there. I have one that I can hire a new ops assistant in December. And then there's another new ops assistant that the operations work stream has the budget for to add in January as well. So um, <clears throat> those would be things that I'll be on the lookout for, for contributors um, that are interested in ops. If that's um, something you are interested in, there should be stuff posted inside the jobs bounty board soon um and our preference here in ops is to have people start to jump into the process a little bit earlier and get familiarize yourself with it before um kind of jumping in so we could see where your talents are um so yeah please if you're interested dm me reach out to me we'll get you all of the roles for triage we may be hiring this one role in december we may end up hiring both roles at the same time in january depending on the interest Um, and then a uh, testing agreement is, I guess, the next one on there. Um, we had this really great resource um, that was constantly, not constantly, was updated when necessary at centralized um, uh, shapeshift that allowed us to be on the same page in an um, di open dialogue between product engineering and operations about what was to be expected when we deploy things, what was to be expected when um, we test things and what those schedules look like, what the depth of our tests look like 
and how engineering can lean on operations or product can lean on operations to um, make their processes a little more simpler, a little quicker, and we can kind of um, connect with them to make sure that we were testing everything specifically along the way. Um, there are some really interesting wrinkles or gray areas that have kind of popped up in my mind around what a new testing agreement might look like in the DAO. Um, being an open source project, we've definitely got um, a whole bunch of work that we're soon to be opening up to be developed on and pushed and merged, basically kind of at the whim of whenever open source projects can can receive that those that work. And that means that maybe ops needs to be more mindful or restart these conversations about what expectations look like for um, testing, um, what's within the realm of acceptability, um, what things need to get queued up so they can be um, appropriately handled and so we don't sweep a leg and bring down the whole system when someone's trying to merge a new feature and they aren't up to date on locally or something like that. So um, this is the conversation that I think we're going to be kind of shaping as we've gone through some of these new um, developments like Web V2, uh, or excuse me, um, yeah, I guess we can call it Web V2, um, but also the osmosis integration is a very interesting one that was proposed really early on in the process. And a lot of the parts have kind of moved and changed and evolved since that proposal happened. So having a testing agreement, I think will make operations feel a little bit more comfortable around what's expected from us from an individual bounty team versus what's expected from us from an engineering work stream and a product work stream. So um, we'd like to have this documented, agreed to, and saved inside a notion um, somewhere so that it can be referenced by all um, concerning party members. And then when things start to break or when we find ourselves in fire, hair on fire situations or difficult um, testing challenges, we'll always have something to lean back on and look at for where um, does the ball fall on and which side of the fence and how to best appropriately handle it. I don't know if anyone on stage has some feelings around uh, those two topics that we just mentioned, new positions or testing agreements and things like that, but I'll open it up to you guys first, um, as well as if the stage has any questions, or excuse me, the audience, please type them out in stage chat. I know uh, Josh uh, requested that we do um, uh, testing uh, day by day. Um, as just like a quality assurance check. Um, I don't know if that was ever going to be a part of the testing agreement, but it is something that Josh brought up a while ago. Yeah, um, if that's a request from engineering, I think that's something we can happily fulfill. I definitely want to define what testing is inside testing every day. And if that means we're doing four chain trades for every single pair, or if that means that we're just making sure that when you click on shapeshift.com, does the website actually load? Because um, there's like a big variance in cost and time and in checking of all the available edge cases that we could get really meticulous about or we could be a little looser on. So um, I know that earlier you, Shifty, pushed me off the ledge um, that I was on where I was wanting us to test every single Thor asset once we turned Thor back on and the gas alone it would cost us to test every single ERC20 pair and especially if we were to do that across every single available wallet service provider that we had what did you quote it at like 5k like five just grand. in gas just in gas alone so um that is I'm pretty sure more than a monthly budget that we've asked for for operations um yeah so, for sure. um, no, That's it's just something, something that, it's something that Josh brought up uh, that we can definitely touch with him about, but he brought it up like, uh, like a week and a half ago. Totally. Um, and looks like Willie just jumped on stage. Do you have some thoughts about um, a testing agreement here or um, what your feels are on this? Yeah, just on the, the topic of like, it's a really good point. You know, you don't need to necessarily test everything and it'd be very expensive and time consuming to test every single little thing. But 
just remembering back to when I used to help with the regression testing stuff and um, how once you do it a lot, you kind of start to get the hang of it and realize that, okay, you know, there's a, there's a few things that are kind of most likely to break um, if, if things like wherever our dependencies are and, uh, and you just test those and, you know, just being strategic about it. Like maybe you test one trade on ThorChain and you make sure Shapeshift ThorChain's integration is working good. And then you check out the, the Thor, Thor, another ThorChain interface and just make sure that there are, there has been volume on all the other pairs or whatever. And then you don't need to actually test every single pair yourself just because it's highly unlikely that, you know, one, one pair would be down or something, but the others, uh, or one pair would work, but the others would be down. So just like, yeah, I agree. I just mean, being strategic about it and, and doing a, a good amount of testing, but also there's a few things that you can test pretty quickly and then just get a, get a good gauge of the overall health of the, the app. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know what you're saying, Willie, and obviously, it, some of us uh, PRs see what you're going to do. Never was. Never was. We're losing you. It looks oh. like either your connection's bad or maybe your service. Um, Trying. Um, uh, uh, okay. Did it get any better at this point, guys? Yeah, go ahead and restart. Okay. So, yeah, no, uh, good point, Willie. I agree. Um, they got to be very strategic about it. But at the same time, um, you know, it, it, as we go along uh, with the open source, obviously, um, you know, having a lot of uh, additional code um, that's going to be entered into a non-centralized uh, repo and stuff like that, I think the skill will come from being able to look at the PRs and get an understanding of what there is they're changing and then kind of going in and seeing what it could affect and what it could possibly break by just looking at the PRs themselves. And that may be something that some pick up on um, sooner than others, but I think that, you know, it'll be something that we'll probably, you know, learn, a, you know, get a better handle on as a, as a squad going forward. We we'll just pick through and, and kind of see, a lot of times what the focus is on and, and be able to address those those concerns when we're testing. Solution that we came up with in centralized um, Shapeshift previously that maybe goes to both of your guys' points there was there was a prod issues prevention checklist that was kind of the high level things to Willie's point that we knew functionality major wise if if this was broken then we we definitely did not want to ship it. And then there were a lot of other things that were much more minor or lesser priority. And those things we still did want to test, but they didn't need to be tested as frequently. So now here in the DAO, we definitely have different priorities on um, how we feel about those features. And I think also in the new feature set of V2, um, there's lots of maybe just things that quite aren't there that we don't need to be as worried about. Um, so yeah, I'd love to revisit those, maybe on a full community call, maybe just more um, with product and engineering uh, PMs so we can make sure that they get in there um, and get their requests in. But yeah, I think there's probably a middle ground we're gonna have to explore and find. Um, and I think digging into those specific PRs really helps us out a lot. Um, but in my experience, um, the knee bone isn't always connected to the thigh bone in um, pushing and deploying and sometimes pushing something in one area, especially an old Axiom code base, would affect something completely different over in another area. Um, and I hope maybe that's not the case in the new OS and we'll find out kind of through falling into these holes or not. But uh, I think we it's there's much to be um, lost from assuming that everything is working as intended. Um, and maybe there's also much to be lost in assuming that everything's broken all the time. So I don't know which spidey sense we're supposed to lean into more. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, that's something that we can figure out with uh, product and engineering on uh, what on a high level uh, should be tested every day um, and what are the costs for that. If the if nothing has changed though, if we're just doing these daily tests too, then fortunately all you really have to test is the the dependencies and make sure that none of the dependencies, none of the things that we have dependencies on are having issues. And 
as long as there's no code changes, you can be pretty pretty self-assured that nothing has just magically broken. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I was trying to say too, Willie. Perfect point. Yeah, we'll find those scales um, um, and balance between where that is, and it probably should be an agreement, um, again, from product and engineering and ops together on what those daily tests entail so we can make sure that if we're only hitting things lightly for sake of gas costs or for sake of time management or for sake of um, not bogging down engineering anymore in their deployment process than they already are, you know, there will be um, trial and error that we'll figure out here. But I think we'll have a good um, set of at least two lists of daily checks and kind of weekly more when we have the time or when gas is lower or when we feel we need to do a full a head to toe check. Um, we can save the time and the energy there. Yeah, 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 I agree. And 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 remember, this is very new code base. You know, we get yet to kind of we'll we'll get a lot more familiar with the code base as as it continues and and know the you know the if there are any problem areas, let's knock on wood that there aren't. But um, you always get you get familiar with the code base you're working with and and the project. So we'll we'll, we'll definitely get a better handle on that aspect as well. Cool. Um, that sounds like a healthy conversation and we're all on the same page there about that now. Um, if you're interested in um, this conversation as we get a testing agreement, um, if you feel strongly about us um, managing this in like a more fiscally responsible way or in a more checking all of the edge cases way more regularly, whichever side of the pendulum you're on, We'd love to have your feedback. Um, I'll try and make all of the posts about the developments of this testing agreement inside the operations public channel so that you can follow along there. And please, if you feel strongly or have some conversation, something to add to the conversation, please join us in on it. Um, and then moving on, I guess this is kind of rolling on. The next subject on that list is maintenance windows and protocols. Um, if you saw earlier on Tuesday, we definitely had a plan to do a maintenance window where all of Shapeshift was going to be down in maintenance mode for a short amount of time while we did some database upgrades. Um, these are some things that don't happen super often inside, I mean, knock on wood. Um, they're not scheduled or planned to happen super often um, in Shapeshift's kind of uptime, but sometimes we do need to um, change things on the back end so much that it's better to remove the front end for end users for a small amount of time so we can ensure things go smoothly and we don't get any sort of loss of information or funds maybe if someone's trying to do a, a trade on one DB that then gets lost in the ether on the upgrade to the other DB. I'm, I'm kind of speaking in more layman's terms than a specific example there, but um, that's why we want to try and prevent users from accessing our front end if we're gonna go into something super deep like an upgrade like that. Um, but we also make sure that we test every possible edge case. This is one of those that a product to prevention test would not be suitable for. Um, and so um, doing tests requires us to be back and have access to the centralized staging environment, which we've gotten everyone on the ops team access to so they can test it. and with vigorous testing with um, the with conscious and some of the engineering people, we've found out that if we did do the maintenance window when we were scheduled to, we would have blown up the world and we wouldn't have come out of maintenance window cleanly. Um, and we all would have been in a hair on fire situation until we reverted and rolled back. So um, that's why we do all the testing that we do. And unfortunately, we kind of jumped the gun on the announcement about that without the full proper testing. Um, and that um, the issue that we're fighting right now is a legacy code um, infrastructure piece called Watchtower, which if you've kind of heard it being talked around, it um, is kind of the chain agnostic service that um, sees all of your addresses and all of your transactions and uploads all of your balances, but that is being replaced by the much more robust and cool decentralized version that we are calling Unchained. Um, 
but that service right now is not getting the same sort of eyes and attention for very good measure um, because we can be focusing more on decentralized projects. But um, Josh is holding that together with uh, paper clips and uh, band-aids and whatever adhesive materials he can find. And because of that, this maintenance window had to get kicked back even later. Um, there was a question I got this morning about um, if it, there was a potential for it to get released today. And if you're not familiar with the idiom, uh, don't push to prod on Fridays, that's something that we definitely heed here um, or try to heed here from experience of not doing that in the past. And that is something that, um, especially of the nature of a database rollover um, like that, we will never um, schedule something that big on a Friday. Um, I hate blowing up people's weekends, um, and Fridays are a great way for us to just make sure that stability is going um, just as we expected and not force ourselves into any unwanted um, situations. So that maintenance window, window has been booted at least to next week. I have not heard of a solve that will mean that we're actually ready to push this staging out to prod. So there will be. Um, Another announcement when I find out some more information. So thanks for being on your toes about it. Um, those that are keeping their teams updated and ready for that, whether you're in support or on the mod uh, work stream or the um, marketing and growth work stream as well. Um, but that's this is definitely a one-off, not something that we're, we do pretty regularly. And we'll try and keep you guys posted about it beforehand so we don't have a whole bunch of dear sir, shapeshift, stole my funds comments all over Twitter and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's maintenance windows um, and the protocol we have around them. Uh, we, I guess the protocol we have around them is for operations side. When someone tells us that we've got to do one of these things, we bake extra math into the time of how long the window should be. If an engineer tells me it's going to be a 10 minute change, I'll give them an hour. If an engineer says it's going to be a 30 minute change, you know, we might go to two and a half hours. Um, that way, hopefully everything runs smoothly and we can set our expectations very low and exceed them by beating them. Or if in the um, oft is the case chance that we run into a bug that wasn't there in staging but happened to be there in prod, we give ourselves the extra wiggle room to be able to address it, um, fix it, and make sure that we can come back up as expected. Um, those maintenance windows usually happen on a group call during the whole time. So in case there's any sort of immediate needs, operations, engineering, we can all be there to solve it. And those will happen either in a E1 all access or maybe even a prod issues channel, depending on the issue, um, things like that. So if you were new to any of this, if you were scratching your head as to why I kept putting big orange alert things out there, um, that's what we were doing. That's kind of the peek back behind the curtain. This will be happening hopefully next week. Now that I said the words next week, it'll probably be later than that. Um, but who knows? I will keep you guys informed as soon as I know. Um, Shifty Lich, do you guys have anything to add about um, your experience with maintenance windows or? Um, never was around do you guys have any thing to add about your new experience coming in and what your your thoughts are on those yeah it it seems kind of silly but um, when you're on the other side of it and you don't get sleep for 48 hours through a weekend because you can't leave your computer, um, it starts to be a nice boundary people like to set. <laughs> um, cool. Um, we'll keep rolling right or wrong, too. If people have questions, feel free to, to post them, but we'll keep moving on this agenda. Um, retros, there's some meetings that operations kind of is in charge of or is not in charge of but more than willing to help organize and schedule and bring people together to um, talk about um, the things that might be going on whether it's a kickoff whether it's a retro whether it's something like a go no go they each have different sort of um, 
goals that we, we get out of them by doing them. Um, they don't always have to be hosted by operations. They can be organized, but hosted by someone else. Um, and we had a really big retro that just happened this Wednesday. And I wanted to talk a little bit about it in the sense that retros can in scope can be anywhere as small as just a, uh, an individual launch of a campaign or it can be as big as what we just did there, which scoped the last almost six months of development and work and goals that we've achieved and issues that we've run into. And the main purpose of these is to reflect back on what went well, um, look back on what didn't go well, and in a very blameless environment, create some action items for how we can continue to lean into the good things that we did and how we can learn to do less of the bad things that we found out we did as well. Um, it was a great call. If you haven't seen it or weren't a part of it, I'm pretty sure it's in the recorded meetings. I do know that um, some of the recording was difficult to hear because of the, the mics and where they were placed in the room and the fact that we did have a group of about 12 of us in an office talking about it. Um, but it was very great, um, expertly documented by um, Matt, uh, Shapeshift Matt, who is someone who's not um, even part of really the DAO going forward anymore, so he's able to bring a nice objective view towards these conversations. And um, let me see if I can find a link for it and drop it in the stage chat. Um, it's uh, some great insights. There's like some really cool processes in terms of the timeline, in terms of the sticky notes and the contributions that everyone is able to put in there. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I can almost open the floor now to see what people want to talk about if they have any questions about it. Um, I can also open it up to you guys up here on the stage if you have feelings about that retro um, or anyone who's in the stage here. This could be a, we can make this a group therapy process session if you'd like. Um, there's a lot of things that were talked about. Um, I think there's some action items, some really great action items that we haven't really begun to start assigning, but I know that they're from the stand up, there was going to be some action made on that next week. Um, but yeah, I think that those are, these retros are extremely invaluable to Shapeshift um, and the DAO. And I hope to see us continue to learn from them and, and host them and um, that they get received well. So I'll leave my thoughts there for a second and see what else anyone else has to say. Yeah, I think that's actually a really um, great uh, fair bit of criticism from that. Um, I think that there was some things that may or maybe communicated in person that um, maybe only were heard by or received in the way they were intended to be from the other people in the room. And that's a bummer that not everyone was on the same page. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was good to experience uh, the first one um, with everybody. Um, I already see a lot of like action items, you know, kind of already got the ball, ball rolling. Obviously, the dial moves very fast and been very agile up to this point. And I see that continuing um, with this as well, where I've already seen, you know, people already in discussions and conversations and actually like action being put in place in certain items. So, um it's always great to be able to kind of look back on stuff and and kind of get like you know um thoughts from a, a, the larger group and and be able to act on those things so it, it, i think it was you know something good to see awesome well if anyone has any um communication or thoughts in the audience they'd like to raise their hand or they'd like to um, type out anything 
um, about their feels or thoughts or what they thought went well or how we could do better with those retro that retro specifically um please feel free to um and if not i'm going to keep moving on um down our list of agenda um similar to retros we've got go no goes and we've had one full go no go that happened since we've been in dow and that was the eric's bounty for the v2 wallet and the yarn integration that got combined together into one larger go no go um and when we did this go no go it was kind of one that just got thrust upon everyone um with just a document that said hey fill this out um and we'll see you at this meeting and there was never really any step back about why or what the intention of these are for and maybe what the expectations or um responsibilities can include inside there so i thought maybe having a brief conversation around that here might help shed some light um, for some folks out there. Um, in Shapeshift's history, we've definitely had some issues of getting everyone um, on the same page or at an understanding of parity, uh, parity of understanding um, on a launch. Sometimes engineering and product and operations get everything ready and we never told customer support about it. And all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of help desk articles that need to be written about the features and troubleshooting steps that that is brand new and we have an entire um support staff that now needs to understand something like staking and uh farming and it was a a thing that had um never been inside our feature set before so we have a learning curve to teach both an entire staff and the users that are coming at us um maybe there's um a specific timeline for a marketing and growth embargo on a PR that needs to go out and we need to have the feature sets live in a certain window. Um, these are all things that um, have a fair share of priority, but having only one perspective um, lead a launch can really leave um, some of these expectations or these guidelines out in the lurch. So um, our way of bringing those all together is to have a meeting where each one of these work streams has a checklist of what they need to feel comfortable for this to launch. And that looks different for every single work stream. And um, there can be specific launch meetings for each work stream where those kind of are identified outside of a go-no-go. -no -go. I would imagine that the marketing and growth needs for a launch are very, very deep um, and specific and kind of granular compared to what a checklist for those might look like on site of go no go um and the same can be said for all the individual tickets and things like that that go into a release from the engineering side um but this allows us to get all of those together um and chat about it in multiple meetings before we launch. Once a work stream has provided all of their expectations or requirements for launch, that might inform another work stream of, oh, we forgot about that, or we didn't know that that was something that was going to be part of this feature set. That changes our list as well. And a go, no go um, should not expect to be a go on the very first one. I don't think I've ever seen a single go, no go, go from everyone getting in the same room to us launching a product. And it's okay if we have multiple go no goes, um, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So these should be living, breathing documents that the information um, evolves over time in the comments of progress or in um, any sort of detailed work about who's assigned to what and the expected timeline of that completion is. And um, we have another go no go that's going to be incoming we actually will have multiple ones attached to the osmosis um launch that will be happening both inside some of the old shapeshift services like mobile and then eventually in some of the new things like v2 so um there's some great information inside the operations notion where you can see all of the completed and in process go no goes um if you'd like to read up on what we've done previously and how we're maybe going to shape it to an even better one. And we haven't set our first go, no go for the osmosis integration, but we are waiting to hear back from the osmosis bounty team, um, which should get back to me um, either by end of day today or sometime early next week. And that will be coming up on the calendar. But 
that hopefully should shed some light on what to expect inside those kind of meetings. Um, I know there's lots of people inside this DAO who come from different sort of launch structures or different checklists or requirements for um, what uh, a, a go fully looks like or what a launch is. And I don't think that there's one true way to do this. So um, we are operating off of the best of the abilities we have from our previous experience with centralized shapeshift. And I hope that if there are other people who have done these kind of launch processes, these kind of um, checklist um, sort of um, audits and have different sort of processes or procedures that they know have been successful from other places, that operations is probably the first place for you to step up in and chat with us about um, the optimizations you'd like to see, and we can really move quickly and get more data, get more analytics, um, get more um, resources thrown at anything you think might be beneficial to these launches so we can be successful. Um, so yeah, I thought I would offer that up as well as we're not, how, we don't have an iron fist over how we run these things. They will continually be agile and updated, but we are going to be running them for any major launch that we do um, because of the way in which it brings everyone together. Even if um, we only have to do two, we'll make sure we're all on the same page and one to kick it out the door. So um, I'm a big fan of them. I used to hate them and now I love them. Um, and I couldn't see a successful DAO without them. Excuse me while I sip my tea. Someone else uh, yeah, share their thoughts. Yeah, I totally agree with you um, that that pending go sliding scale of go, pending go, no go is definitely a little dangerous and contentious, at least here. Um, and maybe doing something like that with timelines might be more beneficial. Um, of course, you then have to hold the accountability that if someone says three days, that in three days, whereas are we, are we at still three days from now or um, have we actually gotten the work done? But um, yeah, I uh, I definitely think that maybe that's at least an, an early place that we can try, probably do some optimization. Also, if there are anyone in the audience that has um, opposing thoughts or feels around some of this procedures or structure, we don't have to be an echo chamber in here too. Definitely I'm open to people who think that maybe I'm being a stick in the mud and slowing everything down so we can all put name tags on or something like that <laughs> um no I, I i i would say it, that um sorry did someone else jump in sorry uh, i saw josh saw josh just happen as well um oh uh hey josh real quick i, I won't talk on promise um yeah i i kind of i don't want to say that echo but um because echo chamber but 
I, in previous incarnations of Go No Goes that I've been involved with a lot from um, ones that lasted, uh, you know, six months to almost a year sometimes if we were building a new building or, or you know, um, the development and design of uh, large construction projects and stuff um, to just simple, you know, moves or launches of software or programs or stuff like that. Um, the in-process has always been controversial only because the accountability aspect of it you know, um, in process does put timelines on things for the most part. It does, you know, tie people to, you know, uh, follow, follow up and follow through. So, um, yeah, I just understand that aspect can sometimes be a little controversial, but, um, I found, uh, and whenever I had to, to utilize that, um, it really did kind of set a schedule. It did allow others to kind of build off of that and, and be able to, um, you know, follow up and follow through with those individuals. And, and really get some answers versus just saying, okay, well, now we got to kick the go, no go to, you know, a week from now or, you know, five, you know I mean, what, it, it has a purpose. It may or may not work. Um, I just wanted to add that little piece and I'll let Josh talk now. Hey, yeah, thanks for having the conversation. I just want to express that I think the go, no goes are super important and they help engineering quite a bit and level set where everybody is so yeah i think we it would just be a problem if we didn't do them uh asking for like timelines instead of just go no go but putting dates on things i think as long as we also keep the go no go column and just add it as additional information i could be game for giving that a shot but don't stop doing them tyler okay i definitely won't um and yeah no that's great feedback figuring out how to find that happy middle ground to both keep what we like and optimize towards more um, beneficial information instead of static is something I'm always interested in. Um, cool. I don't know uh, if anyone had any um, specific things they wanted to share about the osmosis that we had. Um, it wasn't really a go-no-go, no go, but it was a similar sort of kind of meeting of the minds to get us all back towards ex, um, our expectations being aligned, um, which is can also be beneficial for us to have those kind of meetings too. But I think that maybe is more of a kickoff. Um, so, Yeah, that was a funky one. I mean, the meeting itself wasn't funky, but just the circumstances and having it. But I, I think it was, and I know a lot of people expressed at the end, that they, they found benefit from it. I think it was a really important meeting. I think it was like the ex, ex, the prime example of what the operations team should be doing, which is to identify when there is misalignment amongst different work streams happening and then bringing the parties together to create the alignment. And then Tyler, I know that you had some conversations leading up to it to prep the stage for it, which, that was probably the meeting that I thought might have had the potential for the most contention since we became a DAO, except for uh, the the tracking user data information. But um, and I think because of the work that you did beforehand and making sure people understood the purpose in the stage, I think it went really well. So that was pretty much exactly what I would like to see from the operations workstream and you as the workstream leader. So thank you much for doing it all yeah of course thanks josh um and yeah i love um recognizing these circumstances and then seeing how i can kind of behind the scenes make sure that we need to get the right people in the right room so everyone's on the same page before we go to a full um jerry springer style duke out um don't think we need to do that um and i really appreciate you josh for being open to these things when we have to readjust our expectations. Um, if people haven't seen the um, that osmosis one, it, I think it's a really great call. Um, it should be in recorded meetings um, that will have some kind of evergreen topics that are gonna come up in future bounties and um, integrations that we do um, that really highlight some things about like incentives matter and um, how to properly align um, expectations for payments with bounties versus jobs completed. Um, and so I think that we um, 
started to kick the tires on some things that we'll eventually have better processes for in the future. But it's really interesting to see kind of um, what we're talking about here through the lens of the osmosis bounty for implications in the future when it comes to working with engineering to make sure our architecture scopes are met right um, and other things like that. So I highly, highly encourage people to check out um, that call if they haven't or if they're not up to snuff on it. And Josh, I, I, Josh, I know you did. You jumped up on stage a little bit late. I didn't know if you were in the audience earlier, but Tyler did go over kind of the uh, the retro. I don't know if you had additional thoughts on that, um, or if you missed that altogether because of prior meetings. Yeah, but I'm bummed. I missed it. I missed it altogether. Which, but that's all right. Um, the only thing, my biggest takeaway was the. Um, it was kind of on the alignment perspective that we talked about that happened with the osmosis call is that engineering and product and operations are all just going to work more closely on uh, defining a higher level vision and strategy that we can all use to align our actions and maybe avoid situations like what we needed to rectify yesterday when things start happening and there's people don't know what other people are doing. So I, I'm excited about working with the other workstream leaders and the people in the work streams to get some of that figured out. Uh, you know, it's going to be a constant um, process of discovery, right? We're not going to create anything and, and write them in stone. That would be silly. So I'm excited to start that process and create some stuff that can be used. Totally. Um, and thank you for organizing that and getting Matt in on that. He, I couldn't think of a more better person to be able to wrangle us all together and keep us on track. Yeah, and he put together some killer notes too, huh? Yeah, we should figure out how to get him back in the DAO. <laughs> uh, I, he's not here. I went to lunch with him beforehand. It ain't happening. <laughs> yeah, he got he got himself one of those real jobs. He got himself a job. Um, there, this does help me segue kind of nicely into the next um, subject on the agenda. And I'm looking at our time too, and saying we've got three more bullet points um, before we run out of time in 12 minutes. So I quickly want to update that one of the things from that go no go that we learned was that. There's still a big um, hurdle for us as a DAO to take on of onboarding um, in general, whether that's onboarding people into the DAO specifically or onboarding engineers into the engineering work stream or um, onboarding contributors into this cool DAO lifestyle that we have. Um, and I don't think we need an overhaul of the entire process. I think maybe there are just some key areas that we need to spend a little more time time and grease some wheels and provide maybe some more documentation. So one of the things that I'm going to be doing proactively is kind of um, updating and making some changes to our unsolved user problems meeting. If you're not familiar, it's a meeting that we talk about everything inside the triage process um, and then look at our GitHub bug board and all of the certain issues that we've got inside our backlog and re-rank the priority of how important those are. Now that we're in V2, there's a lot of these bugs on this bug board that the dependencies on getting them fixed are all inside open source, source code. So um, Ocean has um, graciously started to um, attach some of these to bounties inside GitHub or Gitcoin. They haven't gone live yet, but I know that those will be imminent soon. And I'm hoping that the unsolved user problems meeting will soon be a place that engineers that are looking for direction on quick bounties on where to go would have a one-stop shop for us to direct them give them any of the resources they need like the readme to get started um and then um really point them to the bounty board and um start getting some of these smaller um bugs out of the way um operations has been holding on to these broken things for so long and we've never had the access to solve the other end of the problem. We've just continually re-ranked them and passed them off to product to reprioritize to engineering. 
And so I think there's definitely a space where we can remove some of that centralized middleman. Um, and it'll definitely still be reliant on Josh and the rest of his team who are going to be approving and merging these issues. Um, but I think operations would love to find out the proper way to interface with engineering to start opening up that funnel more and providing more opportunities for interested parties to jump in and take on a simple task of um, fix, fixing a button or identifying why a specific asset might have an issue with it. So um, that's going to be a change and it'll probably split up unsolved user problems into part of our time talking about the triage tracking and the bugs that have currently happened in the week that we're facing and then the other half focused on the GitHub bug board and how we can start assigning these tickets to people that are in our backlog. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts or feels on that, um, but you're more than welcome to share them here or join us in Unsolved User Problems next week where Lich will be leading us through that process. Um, and I'll keep going. Um, uh, actually, I'm going to pass it to Ron. Ron has a, a project that he's been working on in the background um, that he actually started on when he was DMing Willie before he was ever part of the operations work stream. And because of his passion and interest in contributing to the DAO, that was one of the big um, legs up that he had towards um, being involved in operations and getting more tasks to him. But this is something that has evolved as um, our need for the DAO have kind of become more clear to us and as we've gotten more work streams. So maybe I'll let you talk your, about your DAO counting project right now at a high level and where it was, where it is, and where you want it to go. And so then maybe just taking even one step further back, do you have like a, a 30 second elevator pitch about what the goals of all of this, this information collection would be?
Um, sweet. Um, yeah, I also think it might be um, worthwhile if uh, it looks like there's a couple of work stream leaders in here. If there's specific information that you would love to get analytics on regarding your budget or anything that would be high level inside colony um, or something that would be great for perspective to be added in here that we're not currently scoping. Uh, so please reach out to uh, Ron so we can make sure that we get that in there. Um, awesome. Thank you very much, Ron, for all the work that you've poured into it already. And I hope um, that we don't lose too much from us having a narrow scope and notion beforehand, and you can still reuse a lot of the work that you've already put into it. Awesome. And we got two minutes left, so I feel like that's the appropriate amount of time to talk, give to POAPs. Um, the POAP process is complete and set up inside um, Shapeshift currently. I kind of went over this really quickly at the end of the governance call yesterday, but just to get it um, to more ears and more eyes, we do have the ability to generate new POAPs um, with the caveat that one, we have the artwork generated before we make the POAP itself. And um, that two, um, it is approved by the POAP team before we are able to disperse it. So that second caveat in there and approved of the POAP team is the thing we're struggling with right now because, because of our um, early dive into POAPs and the popularity that, that we had with them, we still have a large backlog of about 25 POAPs that don't have artwork and POAP has been nagging at us basically anytime we interact with them to say, hey, please clean up your stuff before you make new things. And we've snuck a couple of new things in there without cleaning up our stuff. Um, but I think for a gesture of um, kindness to the POAP team and for setting our expectations properly for when we want to kick this back on, we're going to just need to um, pay it forward and do all of those um, POAP artwork and get those submitted. So I have a process going for submitting those back to get those updated. And the backlog is big enough that um, asking one person to do it seems a little um, much. So we've got Irina with the content creation team bouncing out all of these individual POAPs. Um, I'm not exactly sure what they've agreed to for um, the bounty value for these POAPs is, um, but um, that's, that's where we're at. Um, and as soon as that is fixed and finished, we will um, start po pooping out POAPs again, um, POAPing out POAPs again. Um, so with that, we are now at the hour. Um, and I appreciate all of you for sitting around and listening to me monologue for a while. Um, and thanks to everyone on the team. Um, thank you much to Josh for jumping up here and providing your insight here. Um, and I can't wait to have another retro where we can learn even more about ourselves. So thank you all for coming um, and make it a good GM and happy Friday, motherfuckers. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.